In the Glasgow Dilettanti Society's 1830 survey of the exhibition of works of living artists, the observation was made of James Giles that he exhibits pictures in almost every department of art. This apparent eclecticism is hardly surprising. By the time of the exhibition, the 29-year-old Giles had already spent time in France and Italy recording old master paintings alongside impressions of the continental countryside in a series of sketchbooks. He had also established Aberdeen Artist Society with the architect Archibald Simpson, become a founder member of the Royal Scottish Academy and begun to design gardens for Haddo House, country seat of the Earl of Aberdeen. These early experiences laid foundations for what was to become a lifelong exploration of art in its many forms. Giles went on to make a name for himself as a landscape painter, specialising in Scottish countryside and sporting scenes. At the same time, he accepted portrait commissions from notable figures in Aberdeen society. And, if not enough, Giles was involved in civic sculpture projects and even produced what could be described as a series of real estate paintings that helped persuade Victoria and Albert to purchase Balmoral Castle. Such wide-ranging output was perhaps to be expected of an artist who said of himself, I have the feeling about me of doing something great if I could get it out. Giles was clearly a man of many talents and interests, but it appears to me that he always remained at heart an Aberdeen artist. My name is Madeline Ward and I work as lead curator for art for Aberdeen Archive Gallery and Museums. I have the privilege of helping to care for over 300 images in our collection made by Giles. And perhaps it is because of the eclecticism evident in this body of work, the range of influences and interests that ran throughout Giles's career, that I have always been struck by the consistent description of Giles as an Aberdeen artist. What does that actually mean? It seems, for example, a little trite to simply define someone by their hometown. We don't typically introduce Turner as London artist, so why Giles as Aberdeen artist? Should we make something more of it? Perhaps see the phrase as a compliment, a token of his significance to Aberdeen and the artistic success he enjoyed there? Or is it tinged with a note of snobbery, suggesting he had his artistic wings clipped by his allegiance to the city and could have achieved more had he set up shop? in, say, the nation's capital. I would certainly like to understand more about the phrase, and I think it is by looking directly at Giles's life and work that we can reach a fuller understanding of what Aberdeen artist means, not only to us today, but also what it could have meant to Giles over 150 years ago. This oil on board view of Aberdeen from the south by James Giles dates to the 1850s. By the mid-century, the city had been Giles' home for most of his life. He had built his career here, become one of its best-known painters, and was raising a family. Do these simple and unequivocal biographical details then explain why James Giles suits the qualification Aberdeen artist? It would be easy to accept this, and certainly would make for a shorter talk, but somehow I don't think it's enough. Look again at Giles's view of Aberdeen. Painting a picture of Aberdeen could be taken as a defining characteristic of an Aberdeen artist and may justify the qualification. We could decide to read Pride in his hometown in the recognisably Aberdeen built skyline. But this work is more than a simple illustration of a city. It is also an illustration of Giles's style and technique much of which he garnered from his continental tour of the early 1820s. For example, look here at this watercolour work entitled Messina Villa Tivoli, painted by Giles in 1824. Despite the difference in medium, the built architecture sits similarly back in the picture plane and the scene is again framed by trees in the foreground, just as we see in Giles's view of Aberdeen from the south. 
We can expand on this discussion of outside influence if we look back at the Aberdeen view and consider the way we are encouraged to visually approach the city. We come upon it as though discovering it after a long journey through the countryside, the new and urban emerging from an older, timeless natural landscape that dominates the foreground. Is the city almost incidental? Is its placement a device for Giles to demonstrate his understanding of contemporary artistic styles, this time the Europe-wide Romantic movement, suggested by his work's luminosity and mood of discovery? This may be a painting of Aberdeen by an artist living in the city, but stylistically it demonstrates an appreciation and understanding of painting that existed independently from the city he called home. Should we then be wary of accepting the label Aberdeen artist? Could doing so lead us to overlook so much more? So, who was James Giles? Here you can see two self-portraits by Giles. The younger Giles of the 1830s, establishing a promising career in the city. He seems intense, quasi-romantic in the aesthetic sense. His face is lit against the extreme darkness of the rest of the canvas. In fact, the whole portrait is all about the face, suggesting Giles is confident he can convey who he is and all we need to know about him in this tightly framed format. Contrast this with the later self-portrait, in which he cuts a much more statesmanlike figure, an elder of the city and successful Aberdeen artist. The colour palette has changed from the stark chiaroscuro of the earlier work to warmer, muted, relaxed brown and golds, and the sense of urgency has been replaced by self-assurance. In the latter portrait, his face isn't pushed up against the picture plane. He has stepped back. The whole effect is more dignified. This time the artist, the established artist, has the time to paint his cravat and jacket with care. It is easy to appreciate from the latter portrait Giles's status in his own lifetime as one of the city's preeminent artists. So how did Giles achieve this status and become the consummate Aberdeen artist? I suppose the first and most basic point to make is that you don't need to be born in Aberdeen to become an Aberdeen artist. Giles was born on the 4th of January 1801 in Glasgow only moving to the northeast as a young child when his father found work as a pattern designer at Woodside Mill. The family moved to Aberdeen just as the city was transformed with the addition of the Union Bridge. At 40 metres, it is still today the largest single span granite bridge in the world. The bridge can be seen here in this creamware jug created to commemorate its opening in 1805. The bridge was intended to provide an impressive approach into the city from the south and west, and as such would have influenced how the Giles family navigated the city in their day-to-day -day lives. The bridge's existence is key to a watercolour prospect of the area painted by Giles after 1820. The identity of the building he depicts from the bridge is obscure, but could be an anticipation of what the view might look like were one of his friend, the architect Archibald Simpson's, designs to be brought to life. Simpson is seen here in a portrait by Giles of around 1840. Together with Simpson, Giles made one of his key contributions to Aberdeen, the founding in 1827 of Aberdeen Artists Society. Giles was president and Simpson vice president, and the aim of the society was the mutual improvement of painting and the furtherance of art in general in Aberdeen. And though the society stalled under Giles's stewardship, the motivations behind it suggest both men were keen to improve the cultural prospects of their hometown and its people. Speaking of improved prospects, Simpson's contribution to the fine granite street architecture of the city as we see it today cannot be understated. We can see Simpson's triumphs today as we walk around the city streets. 
but it is through Giles's contemporary illustrations of Simpson's designs that we get a true sense of their impact on the Victorian city. Evidence of this can be seen here in this image of the three East, West and South churches. The scene is unrecognisable today. Indeed, after decades of decline, the church spire is now incorporated into a new apartment development. But in this lithograph print, after an original work by Giles, we get a sense of what the city's residents were able to enjoy. The grandeur of Simpson's designs and Giles's efforts to document these many new additions to the city are indicative of their shared sense of pride in and sense of belonging to Aberdeen. But this wasn't new to Giles or simply a result of his association with Simpson. His taste for recording the architecture of Aberdeen can be traced back to the beginning of his career. In a work of 1820 entitled Scottish Scenery, in Aberdeen Art Gallery's collection, we can see six lithographed plates showing different images from around Aberdeen. Four associated with the River Don, one of Old Aberdeen Cathedral, and finally one of the Bridge of Granham. Here we can see one of the River Don scenes, set near the Bridge of Balgowney. The caption reads, drawn by James Giles, near the Bridge of Don, printed at the Deaf and Dumb Institution. The original pictorial cover of this Aberdeen compilation is inscribed, drawn by James Giles, and states that the whole work was printed at the Deaf and Dumb Institution. This is possibly the only surviving work from the institution, which itself had only been established on the city's King Street in the previous year, 1819. Its constitution stated that it is the sole purpose of the society to provide in the best and most efficient manner for the education of deaf and dumb children. It seems progressive for the era to have seen the definition of education as also including the mechanical creation of art, and it speaks volumes of Giles's meaningful contributions to Aberdeen to see his involvement here. Giles's interest in his hometown's built environment was not limited to documentation and illustration. Far from it, as he also left his own physical imprints on the city. This colourful terracotta figure of the Roman goddess Ceres was designed by Giles in the 1840s and is located on top of a building on the corner of Union Street and King Street. The building was designed by Archibald Simpson to house the North of Scotland Bank. Giles's choice of Ceres, a classical figure associated with prosperity, was the perfect choice for a bank. Here she is shown accompanied by a lion and holds a cornucopia of the fruits of the earth. The cornucopia, or abundant supply of good things, although Giles could never have known it at the time, is just as apt for a bank as it is for the public house the building has become today, the popular city centre pub Archibald Simpson's. The statue was not a one-off foray into architectural design. In the 1850s, Giles planned the layouts of Rubislaw Terrace and Abbotsford Place, and in 1860 was commissioned to design the obelisk commemorating Sir James MacGregor for Marshall College's quadrangle. The obelisk is now located in the city's Duffy Park. Giles's interest in recording the architecture and contributing to the architectural development of Aberdeen was a consistent and significant feature of his career and definitely something worthy of the accolade Aberdeen artist. Just a short walk from Union Bridge is John Street. It was here that Giles's father, in addition to his day job, taught drawing and painting from a private academy. Following in the footsteps of his father, before the age of 20, Giles was also teaching private classes. By 1822, Giles was represented by print seller and art dealer John Hay. The relationship had had its roots in Giles's youth, as the 13-year-old Giles had then supported his family by painting miniature figures on the lids of snuff boxes for John Hay. And it seems to have been Hay who acted as catalyst for Giles's successful Aberdeen career. In 1822, it was Hay who introduced Giles to William Gordon of Fivey, 
the first of Giles's important northeast patrons. The success of this introduction can be seen here in a painting of Fivey Castle dated to 1828. Giles's choice of perspective and prospect is worth comment. He has chosen not to recreate a full elevation and allow the viewer to approach the castle as if they would or were arriving for a formal visit. Instead, we have a corner prospect and the whole monument is elevated high above us. We seem to have arrived at this commanding baronial style edifice, having trekked cross country to reach it. One of Giles's most notable patrons, an overtime good friend, was George Hamilton Gordon, 4th Earl of Aberdeen, and from 1852 to 55, Prime Minister of Great Britain. From 1830, Giles started creating a design for the landscape of the grounds at Haddo House. This included ornamental lakes, drives and walks, and woodlands and deer park. The friendship between the two men grew, and between 1838 and 55, Lord Aberdeen commissioned Giles to produce 85 views of the castles of Aberdeenshire, completed in a combination of watercolour, pencil and wash. Indeed, the friendship was so close that the popular anecdote had it that Giles ruled the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister in turn ruled the nation. Giles's diaries and account books show that he worked on the grounds of numerous estates in the North East, Craigievar, Corse, Ellen, Fintray and Kingswells. It could therefore be argued that it was Giles's location in Aberdeen that enabled him to build a client base that included some of the region and realm's most influential figures. Certainly it was by dint of geography that Giles was able to earn his royal commissions, a series of images of old Balmoral, which influenced first the lease of the estate by Victoria in 1848 and its eventual purchase by Prince Albert in 1852. The other factor influencing Victoria's earlier decision to lease being a series of climate reports, sensible enough when the Scottish weather is taken into account. Later in 1855, Giles assisted Albert laying out and planting the gardens of New Balmoral. One might have expected Giles to celebrate such royal patronage, and yet he wrote in his diary, I would rather not work to royalty. I have never made anything but a loss to it. The illustrious profile of Giles's patrons, however, did not divert the artist's attention from Aberdeen and its people. The few portrait commissions by Giles in Aberdeen's collection suggest he was a painter who formed part of the civic fabric of the city, that he knew and worked within a network of figures key to the functioning and prosperity of Aberdeen. Here we see two such figures, Town Bailey James Forbes and John Ramsey, author and editor of the Aberdeen Journal. Though the portraits are few in number compared to works in other genres, their subject matter speaks volumes of Giles as a man about town. None more so than this amalgam of subjects, or heads of Aberdeen personalities, which includes many leading figures from town, gown, law and religion. Giles may be best known today for his landscape paintings of Scottish countryside and sporting scenes, and is unfortunately less well known than some of his contemporary Aberdeen artists, for example John Philip and William Dice. And yet, despite their greater fame, it is Giles who remains synonymous with the city, the consummate Aberdeen artist. I believe this is because he made a particular effort to be an Aberdeen artist. He was not only interested in, but also proactive in supporting the cultural and civic development of his city, evident in his artwork, architecture and contributions to city life. I hope that in looking at these selected images from Aberdeen's collection of Giles's work, that we have begun to understand a little more about what the phrase Aberdeen artist might mean in the context of Giles's life and career. I don't think Giles would have taken any offence at the description. In fact, I think he might have quite liked it. Now, 150 years since his death in Aberdeen, Giles deserves to be a celebrated son of the city and it seems timely to have imagined why for James Giles there was quite literally no place like home.